Why is it illegal against the rules bad form to split an infinitive? Perhaps a better question might be, what the heck is an infinitive? And why would you want to split it in the first place? The infinitive is sometimes called the dictionary form of a verb. To eat, to drink, to speak. And there are other conjugations of verbs. Eat, ate, eaten, I will have eaten, I will not have eaten by the time I got there, so please save me a sandwich. But when you use the infinitive, to eat, you're not supposed to separate the to and the eat. I want to eat. Okay. I don't want to eat. Okay. But if you write or say, I want to not eat, that is a violation of the grammar rules. And not so much anymore in spoken language, but if you're writing a paper, it's considered bad form to split the infinitive. This represents a very common battle, particularly in the world of grammar, between the descriptivists and the prescriptivists. The descriptivists look at language as an emergent system that comes from our nature. And to communicate, it's really only important to make sure that your idea is expressed in a way that it can be understood. And if you use some incorrect grammar, so what? The purpose of communication is to get your point across. This is the descriptive view. Then you have the prescriptive view. These are people that think there are certain rules that must be followed. And certain people are self-appointed self -appointed keepers of the rules. These are the people that read posts on the internet and see somebody that says, I went to their house, but they spell their T-H-E-R-E, -E, and these people start to hyperventilate because they used the wrong word. How dare they? Don't they know how much this bothers me? Because I know the rules of grammar. Why can't they do what they are supposed to do? I read a book once <clears throat> by an economist, Dr. Professor Thomas Sowell, a small government, free market, conservative economist. And the name of the book is the vision of the anointed. And according to Dr. Soul, there are two types of people in the world. Those with the tragic view and those with the anointed view. Those with the tragic view see the world the way it is. And it's called the tragic view because the world is not fair. The world is much less than ideal. A pack of lionesses will watch a hippo give birth a long and painful birth. When the hippo is finished, the lionesses move in and eat the hippo and kill the hippo at the same time. The world is vicious, but from the view of the tragic-minded person, what are you going to do? you got to get in the game and do your best. Try not to hurt anybody. Try not to get hurt yourself. Hopefully live a good life. On the other hand, there is the anointed view. These are the people that look out into the world and they see the world that's broken. And unless they're talking about the world being broken in terms of the trees are not in the right places or the lakes are not deep enough or the elliptical orbit of the earth is the incorrect formula, when they say the world is broken, they say people in the world are not doing what they think they should do. And because the vision of the anointed, the view of the anointed, the mindset of the anointed is that because they see the broken world, they should be in charge of changing the world. And when they say change the world, they mean change people's behavior. I know what you should be doing better than you know what you should be doing because I have the anointed view. I know better about what you should be doing than you do. These are the people that are always trying to tell other people what to do, what words to use, how to spell them.
another book by Matt Ridley, a science writer called The Rational Optimist, explains how this is essentially the cycle of society over and over and over. You have the beginnings of a society where most people are just doing their own thing. They're trying to make ends meet. They're trying to make a life for themselves. But as society ages, more and more people shift from the tragic view to the anointed view. And as society gets old and corrupt, you have more people making the rules than you have following the rules. And eventually everything collapses. There's a few hundred years of some kind of a dark age, and it starts over again. And this is the cycle of history over and over and over again. <clears throat> I remember back when I was in college, not too much different in time when that snake came out of my pants. <laughs> and I was sitting in physics class, and we had an interesting physics professor. He was from Russia, back when Russia was the Soviet Union, and he escaped from the Soviet Union. And this was during the Iran-Contra scandal, if you remember. Reagan wanted to kick all the communists out of Central America, but Congress wouldn't let him. And so they had to do all these kind of secret ways to get money and funnel arms and do all these secret deals. And the CIA was selling cocaine in the inner city to make money to buy the weapons to ship to the anti-communist forces. And it became a huge scandal. And every Wednesday, these people would line up in front of the library in a silent protest. They would just stand there for an hour with these signs, get out of Central America, quietly. And one day, for no obvious reason, this escapee from the Soviet Union physics professor just went off on this rant. You Americans don't know what it's like to be living in a communist state. They tell you where you can work. They tell you where you can live. They tell you how much money you can make. They tell you who you can get married to. They tell you where to live. They tell you what you're allowed to say. And if you say the wrong thing, they will torture you and kill you. This is something those silent idiots will never understand. And everyone, wow, that's fantastic. Yahoo. Even though I don't think anybody really understood what he was talking about because we were uninformed college students back then. One time when I was in high school, I was in algebra class, and we had this kind of lazy algebra teacher. He would come in, he would teach for about 10, 15 minutes. He would assign us our homework, and then we would sit there in class and do our homework until the bell rang and we were allowed to leave. And he would just sit there and read the paper. And one day I was talking to my friend who sat next to me about what a fraud this was. This authority figure reading the paper makes us sit here waiting. Why can't we wait outside? Why do we have to wait for this arbitrary sound from an arbitrary clock that allows us to leave? Why can't we leave when we want to leave? So we decided we would rebel against the system. We would stand up before the bell rang. We would leave a revolution. And so we got ready. We looked at the clock. Five minutes left. It's getting close. Three minutes left. We were preparing what we were going to tell our parents when they had to pick us up at the police station because we started a revolution at school. Two minutes. Stand up. And then everyone else in the class stood up. And the teacher looked up from his newspaper, looked at the clock, looked at us, shrugged his shoulders, went back to the paper. And our revolution against the arbitrary rules fell flat. No revolution. I watched a history documentary once <clears throat> about these secret societies. And there's a lot of secret societies over the past history. And generally speaking, these secret societies are really just kind of made up. They set up a kind of collection of arbitrary rules. They are very selective about who they let in their secret club. They're very secretive about what they talk about in their secret club. And if they last long enough, people start to wonder what's really happening. And if they last more than a couple generations, people start to imagine all these crazy things that they're doing, all these crazy things that they're capable of. 
but it's really just based on a whole bunch of arbitrary rules that are just made up just so they can pretend to be elite, so they can pretend to be different than everybody else. About 200 years ago in Victorian England, which was the late or the mid to late 1800s, there was a massive battle between the British citizens over who could demonstrate their elite status. And between British citizens of that time, they didn't demonstrate their elite status by their Louis Vuitton bags or how many Instagram followers they had. They demonstrated their elite status by how they spoke. And this is still true today. If your ears are trained to the British accent, you can tell an upper class accent from a lower class accent. A lot of British politicians speak in a very upper class accent, but if you watch TV shows like the Peaky Blinders, they speak in a very working class accent. But back in the day, in the mid-1800s, they competed fiercely over who could speak the best Queen's English. And there's a lot of language schools that were teaching these elite class people how to demonstrate how socioeconomically higher they were than everybody else. And a lot of these language schools started to borrow grammar rules from Latin because this was when the sun did not set on the British Empire. And so these super rich, aristocratic, upper class British people thought that they were kind of like the new Rome. And because the elites of Rome spoke Latin and everyone else spoke Greek, they figured if we can speak English that's based on Latin, that will show how elite we are to everybody else. And one of the rules they borrowed from Latin was the infinitive. In Latin, the infinitive is one word. But in English, it's two words. So they just started to take this one word phrase and treat this English two word phrase as if it were a one word phrase. And that would allow them to talk in a way that would allow them to show off that they went to the best language schools and they used the best language usage and the best grammar to demonstrate how better they were than everybody else. And 200 years later, this rule still persists. So because 200 years ago, a group of aristocratic English people wanted to flex their socioeconomic power over everybody, they stole a rule from Latin, brought it into English, and that is why to this very day, it is illegal to split an infinitive. Thank you.